knowledge, used 172 times in 169 verses of the Bible. The art of defeating ignorance and gaining knowledge, both divine and natural. War is hell on earth. It is not God's perfect will. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Henry. And I'm Janice. This is the Quick Study Television Program. Thank you for joining us today as we go through the Bible in one year. We engage rules of engagement, these topics and these subjects that are very difficult for us to wrestle through, but they are very wise for us to work through. From Deuteronomy chapter 19 to 21, today we're gonna to be talking about war. Now it's true that war is hell on earth, but we're gonna deal with this subject in a very interesting way coming up in just a moment. Stay there as we continue. Corey is here with Bible Archaeology. Corey? Today we are going to be examining some of the laws that pertain to slavery in the Bible and seeing how they compare with some of the contemporary laws of that day. Now, there is a spiritual component to slavery as well, which we'll get into in a future program. I think you'll find it to be fascinating. Do you know? Mm -hmm. Do you know what was never to be removed from your neighbor. Never. Never. No conditions. No conditions. Absolutely not. Yep. Okay, there you Never have it. Remove. We're going to find out. And if we have time, we'll talk about the quick study key, an 8 gig key that fits into your USB computer, and why that's important to your life. Coming up in just a moment, also watch the information surrounding uh, this program, and you'll see promos how you can get it. Deuteronomy chapter 19 is all about the cities of refuge that were given as an inheritance to the tribe of the Levites. Right now, you and I are going to take a look at some of these key cities. A fascinating feature of God's law expressed in the Torah is the allotment of land to be given to the Levites. The Levites were completely responsible for the holy things of the Lord, and as such did not receive a normal inheritance. Instead, their inheritance was the Lord, and cities were to be freely given to them by the other tribes. Forty-eight cities were given, six being uniquely refuge cities, where accidental murderers could run to for protection. Here, they would be safe, but they could not leave until the death of the current high priest. Symbolically, his blood would count for the blood debt of the accidental murderer. Until the death of the high priest, though, the walls of the city were your guide to life. Leave the city, leave your protection. Three of these cities of refuge were named by Moses before the takeover of the promised land. They were spread out on the east side of the Jordan River. Bezer was a city in Reuben's territory that would later have run-ins with Moabite King Mesha in the days of Ahab, Jezebel, and Jehu. Ramoth was the second city of refuge called Ramoth Gilead. It no doubt saved the lives of many, but the willful murderer King Ahab was mortally wounded trying to recapture this city from the Arameans. Golan is a fitting name for the third city of refuge. It means enclosure. Kadesh in Galilee is the first city of refuge west of the Jordan. Its name means sanctuary and was the scene of the events of Deborah and Barak in Judges 4. 
Shechem and Hebron have long histories in the Bible, including Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph's travels, and Joshua renewing the covenant at Shechem. Both cities retain their importance for many generations. Together, these six cities provided man with a refuge, a safe harbor. Some might see it as a prison, but to those surviving, the psalmist's words ring true. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. It's time to explore the wise guys in the Bible, and they are all around us. Now, today our reading is Deuteronomy 19 to 21. Wise guys always understand that war is a human invention. In the New Testament, James teaches us that war begins in the heart. In Deuteronomy 20, we enter the slimy, stinky, uncomfortable cell of human warfare. Now, there are guidelines that God places upon ancient Israel. Wise guys know that God does not desire war for man, but that man has desired war and created a world full of it. So God prescribes prohibitions for the hell on earth called war. Remembering this, that war is not forever, there will come a time of no more war when Christ himself rules the earth. Deuteronomy 20, 1 through 7. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be, when you are on the verge of battle, that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, Today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint, do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, What man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Also, what man is there who has planted a vineyard and has not eaten of it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there who is betrothed to a woman and has not married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man marry her. Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 through 7. War is hell. There is no question about that, and I mean that in every literal sense of the world. Now, um, when I speak on this subject, I'm not going to get into the just doctrine causes and all of that. I'm not going to get into any of that. We're going to deal with the reality but I need to tell you my position. My position on war is this. Anytime there is a war in the world, I consider that to be a failure of the church. You see, the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And I believe that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has the ability, if it stays faithful in prayer, and if it stays faithful in service to God and devotion to Jesus Christ, has the ability through spiritual means to pray peace in. Uh, I believe that very strongly. And so that is my position. Now, I'm not going to argue that position necessarily with those who are, have uh, military careers with war and they have seen the reality of human nature. I understand what you're saying and, and I get it. However, what I want to talk about today is how the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 20 deals with the reality of hell on earth. It is very interesting. And a lot of people struggle with this part of the Bible because they don't know how to take it. But to me, there's very clear principles here 
simply uh, taken as we look at them carefully. We're going to start by looking at Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Israel, when you go to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now here's the very first principle of spiritual warfare and physical warfare. War is hell on earth. It is not God's perfect will. But God promises to defend the innocent and the righteous. It is more important when we face a world full of conflict in the last days that Jesus says wars and rumors of wars. It is more important for us to tend to the, the disposition of our own individual hearts before we go off half cocked yelling and screaming at political rallies. We need to make sure that we understand the basic principles of what's going on. The principle is that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah chapter 17. That's what the Bible says. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no one human being who is any better than any other human being. Uh, all are created in the image of God. Male and female, he made them in his image. Uh, the, the women are not lesser than the men, and the men are not lesser than the women. There is no culture or nation or race, and race is not even a biblical concept. It's an evolutionary concept. There is none that is somehow superior than the other. That's very important. So what we deal with here is we understand that war is hell on earth, not God's perfect will, but God promises to defend the righteous. We must focus on us being right with God and not worrying about where our enemy is. Now, secondly, uh, we move on to Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 2 to 4. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint, and do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you, against your enemies, and to save you. Now here is the third study-wise point. War always has a spiritual component to it, and it is wise to desperately seek the help of God's hand to bring protection and provision uh, into your situation. Now I want to tell you something. I know for a fact that our modern secular governments and secular societies who've kicked God out of everything would never ever consider such a ludicrous idea that I'm about to pre present on international television. This idea would be laughed out of the diplomatic circles of the hierarchy of the UN. It would be laughed out of all the major governments of the world. But let me tell you something. If you have a position of leadership and you're dealing on the brink of war, this is the time to proclaim a fast to God, to avoid war. This is the time to call a day of prayer, not when it's politically expedient, but when we are desperate. That's the time to call for the church to get on its knees. Oh, that America, oh, that Canada, oh, that Britain, and the nations of the world would learn the power of prayer from the biblical God. May God make it so someday soon in our world. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 5 to 7. Then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, What man is there who has built a new house and not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle and another man dedicate it. Also, what man is there who has planted a vineyard and not eaten of it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there who is betrothed to a woman who has not married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle, and another man marry her. This is amazing, because here we have a principle that God gives us through Moses, and it's this, a study-wise principle. War is Satan's plan to mass murder families, children, callings, and purposes but God will protect it if he is called upon. Oh my goodness. I believe, I was, I was talking to a, a friend of mine uh, who it was a friend of my father's. He, he's gone on to be with the Lord now and he was a, a great veteran of World War II, a United States veteran in the army. He was at Pearl Harbor. And when Pearl Harbor was attacked uh, at the beginning of World War II for America, it was the beginning of World War II for Britain a lot earlier than that, and France and Europe, but for America, it started at Pearl Harbor. 
And what happened was they made this movie called Pearl Harbor. And I thought about that, and so I went back to my friend, and I, I Jake, uh, what, what was the movie? Did you see the movie? Yes, I did. What was it like? And I'm talking to him several years back. He's, uh, he was 80 years old. And he said, Ron, I want to tell you something. He said, they left out such a major part of that movie. They left out a major part of history. I said, what, what could they possibly leave out? I mean, these are Hollywood directors, the best of the best of the best, Hollywood actors. What could they possibly leave out? He said, Rod, they completely ignored the desperate prayer meetings that began to take place in the churches across America when World War II started. And I thought about that. And I thought about in the future, and as we face wars and rumors of wars, is there a church that will spend days praying against war? Is there a church that will pray that the spirits behind the men posturing with their weapons will stand down? Is the church relevant in the face of international disaster from war? If it is, the Bible says it is, then we should act like it is and have prayer meetings. Deuteronomy chapter 20 contains protective laws for prisoners of war and slaves in Israel. Now right now you and I are going to take a look at why this is extremely unique. Contained within the law of Moses are seemingly harsh and seemingly lenient prescriptions to social issues. Many of the issues discussed in the Bible's law can also be found discussed in contemporary legal documents due to the similar issues that arise in close cultures. But the Bible's context or framing of the law is vastly different, and some of the biblical discussion is completely unique. The Bible presents a morality code, claiming God's holiness as the moral source, the foundation for why people should live the law. It's not just punishments for causing economic trouble. One of the unique and surprising morality codes has to do with Israelite and foreign slaves. In the surrounding cultures, slaves, prisoners of war, and concubines are seen as economic property. In the Bible, this is reversed. According to Exodus 21 and Deuteronomy 15, Israelite slaves, male or female, are only to be enslaved for six years, after which they may choose to go free or bind themselves to their master for life. The Bible here is specific about the master's appropriate attitude. They're to be grateful for the slave's service and send them away with gifts. They're to remember that all Israel was once enslaved in Egypt. The Bible also regulates the common cultural practice of taking concubines. These women are to be treated as wives. They may not be bought or sold and must be provided for as a wife whether or not they please their master. If he fails to comply with these laws, the woman is free to leave because according to the Bible, he has acted treacherously toward her. Even foreign female captives receive protection under the law. Deuteronomy 21 allows them a month of mourning for their fallen homes and families, during which they're not to be touched. After which, Israelite men may marry them as wives with full legal protection. Television offers the Quick Study Wise Guide. It is a print companion to this program. With daily commentary, the Study Wise Notes, Wise Guides commentary, and much more. But we need your help to stay in production. When you support in any amount regularly, we can send you this beautiful monthly guide automatically every month. 
If you give online, you can also automatically download the guide when you give. To help us out and keep Quick Study strong in the month of February, please write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W 5G2. You can also support online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Thank you in advance. We need your help today. You know, it's amazing to me, Corey, as you studied about slavery and some of the ancient things surrounding it uh, and the injustices that were done. It is a very ancient practice, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's one of the most ancient practices, actually. Um, and with varying conditions and varying successes uh, with the economy throughout time. But a lot of times, uh, because of our recent past in North America with slavery, uh, we tend to think of slavery as one thing, when in reality it's something different uh, in the different time periods that the Bible covers. And it's interesting because there is a spiritual component to slavery. The Bible says that uh, he, God told Adam uh, to have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the animals, but not over each other. Mm -hmm. So whenever we practice dominion over each other, we are violating a principle of God's primary covenant, right. same principle he gave to Noah. And so it releases a whole new deal, a whole new spiritual thing happening, which we don't have time to get into on this program, but we'll get into it in the future. All right, what is this do you know? This is interesting to me. Well, do you know what was never to be removed from your neighbor? Never. Mm. Never. Never. Never to be removed mm -hmm. from your neighbor. Don't ever remove it from your neighbor. Okay, Corey, what do you think? Um, I think it's actually his inherited land, and that is uh, shown by the boundary markers, the boundary stones that would be set up around the land. Okay, so uh, she is going with boundary markers. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're going to go with? I have to go with my daughter. All right. um, now I have a few thoughts on it, but go ahead. It, that's uh, absolutely right, and we learned that uh, Deuteronomy 19, verse 14 talks about that. Um, but I want to go way back into Genesis and quote something from chapter 31, verses 51 and 52. Then Laban said to Jacob, Here is this heap, and here is this pillar, which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. So these ancient landmarks uh, were pillars. Uh, they were heaps of stones. They could have been a ridge or a post or by a single stone set upright about a rod apart serving as a boundary marker. And sometimes what people would do would be over time, they would go and move these markers to get more land. To get more land. It was, it was cheating really and um, I just I found a lot of really interesting little things about this and what I found fascinating was there's many ancient law codes in the Babylonian the Egyptian Greek and Romans prohibiting the removal of landmarks so it wasn't just uh, with the with the Israelites and in the British Museum there are some curious Babylonian monuments which are supposed to have been landmarks and they're covered with curses on some of them to, hmm. to people who will remove them. One is said to be made of marble in the shape of a massive fish. On the head is the figure of a serpent and various other characters, and on the sides, in arrowhead letters, are the curses. That's Babylonian. Wow. In the British Museum. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, the, the, in the Bible, the, the idea here is that the boundary represented a physical manifestation of a covenant. Right. And so whenever you start messing with covenants, mm -hmm. that's why Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's why uh, the eighth commandment says, thou shalt not steal. And the tenth commandment says, thou shalt not covet. So don't even, don't, stealing's not an option, so don't even look at somebody else's property or what God has given somebody else. That's right. Yet in today's world, uh, in our modern society, mm. you basically steal what you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do it in taxes. Uh, government tries to steal from us in taxes. Uh, people try to steal from the government in taxes. Uh, in our world today, it's all about looking out for number one. Yet all through Deuteronomy, we see take, the, take care. To, you know, if you see your neighbor's donkey or falling in the ditch, get it out of the ditch mm -hmm. and take care of it for him. 
Very interesting mm -hmm. uh, contradiction. And so it's all about covenant. And we serve a covenant God. And the language of God, the God of the Bible, is a covenant language. So when we start to mess with the covenants, uh, as, as uh, pastor, my associate senior pastor Don Fitchett says, start to move those ancient landmarks uh, surrounding the covenants, whether that be marriage covenant, business covenants, family covenants, covenants with God, then God is going to be upset mm -hmm. and there is going to be judgment that follows. And so, I mean, that's just a And when principle. you start with one area, then it becomes easier to let it affect other areas of your life as well. It's a slippery slope. Very yes. interesting. All right, so here is Call to Prayer. It is always Satan's will to start and perpetuate war. War on earth is Satan's glory machine. It is never God's perfect will to see his creation ravaged by war. There are times because of evil's work on earth that defenses must be made. But it is God's wisdom at work in us when we realize that the real battle begins in the spiritual realm. It is always better to contain Satan's war machine to the spiritual battles rather than to let them break free in the physical world. Wars have been stopped and even prevented by the power of prayer. So today we pray, Lord, in these last days, I dedicate myself to extra prayer for peace in this old world until you come again and bring it yourself. We continue in our commitment of going through the Bible in one year and our commitment to read through the book of Proverbs. Now our reading assignment today is Proverbs 10 verse 17. Now look at this one, this is a good one. He who keeps instruction is in the way of life, but he who refuses correction goes astray. You know, there's a lot of things associated with refusing correction. When we are so proud that we think we can do everything right, it's, the word is called arrogant. A fancy word for it is hubris, where we think we need nobody to tell us what to do. We've achieved and we're doing what we want to do and everybody else leave us alone. Let me tell you what happens. We get into a wreck because we are our own God. And when that happens, we define our whole worlds and our worlds fall apart. You might be there right now. You might be in the place where you're ready to give your life to Jesus Christ. And so today, I want to extend that invitation to you. You say, well, Rod, how do I do that? It's real simple. It's a prayer that God always promises to hear. And it goes like this. You simply say, Father, in Jesus' name, I come to you. And I believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again to take my sin away and give me eternal life. And I confess Jesus as my Lord today. Thanks for joining us today on the Quick Study television and radio broadcast. We're supported by viewers just like you. Will you help us this month of February? Simply pray about it and find out more by going to BibleDiscoveryTV.com.